About 25, actually. When it reached that stage? <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when the software is older than most of the people you're talking to. All right. Yeah. So, and yeah, of course, that's the... Okay. The title has changed, but it was about Zen. Uh, yeah. But it's a different Zen than most of you. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. So no, Zen comes back anyway. Okay, so um, that's me. I work at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. And um, first, uh, since they're paying for this, I have to say something about my sponsors, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Science, and Technology of Japan. There are two grant numbers there. You don't need those, but I do. And um, I will mention that after a decade of trying to get this funded, finally they funded it. I'm not sure what happened. Um, maybe I just got older or something. Uh, what about me? Why am I writing this? Why am I doing this? I've been participating in Python development since about 2005, maybe a little bit for, uh, before that. Um, if you look up the date on PEP 263, um, I didn't actually help write that, but I was pretty noisy in, at the time because I knew a fair amount about internationalization and Unicode. And at that time, getting Unicode into Python was a big deal. Um, they were already on version 2 at that point. Um, 1.6 was the first one that had Unicode in it. but uh, that didn't work very well, and it couldn't be used in the program. Um, it would, you could handle it in I.O., write it to files and things like that, but you couldn't use it in the program, so that was a problem. Um, I don't know everything about FOSS or Python for that matter, but I have talked extensively with several of the core developers and uh, about the process of building Python and releasing new versions and so on, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, I'm an economics professor. A couple of people have you know, made you stand up to make sure you're awake. Um, people uh, object to you leaving. This is not my problem. Uh, as an economics professor, I have very low standards for those who listen to me. They sleep a lot. They get up and they leave in the middle and so on, so feel free. Um, and once again, I teach at the University of Tsukuba in Japan, um, which is, it likes to think of itself as the um, uh, MIT of Japan, but it isn't really. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is something that I started doing when I started this project. Um, was it going to be worth doing the project? Specifically, uh, if you look around, you can see there are big proprietary firms out there. Um, some of them make so much money that their, uh, their um, CEOs can spend money on yachts to the extent that uh, you could buy most of the companies of the people in this room. But uh, more of that money goes back into the company, right? So you'd think that proprietary development ought to be able to drive FOSS out of the market, especially the volunteer projects like Python, um, most of the GNU projects, and so on. Uh, of course, Linux and several other projects have substantial corporate backing these days, but there are a lot of it a lot of volunteer projects, a lot of student projects, and aren't those just going to become small as the software industry gets bigger and more well-funded? So, um, and the other, there's another problem is that the success that we've seen to date with Linux, Python, and these other projects is very much based on the advantages of open source development methodology. Seeing the code, the many eyes, modularity that's encouraged by insisting on reusability. But companies can do that too. They just don't license it the same way that we do. Okay, so you would think that the, for the proprietary business models could probably take this over and neutralize that advantage. Um, what I did was I constructed an economic model which the details don't matter, but the um, results look like this. You know, you've seen these exponentials before, and the one on top, the green one, is proprietary software, and the one on the bottom is uh, FOSS, and it looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Um, oh, and the um, little scary face there is the reason why I'm using Safari instead of Mozilla or um, Firefox. Well, that's the worst case, and in fact, um, although it looks like things are getting very, very bad, things are actually getting pretty good. What happens in the model that I constructed is that the ratio of production of proprietary software to FOSS stays constant in the long run. It's proportional to the growth of the labor force. 
And this is, goes back to a model by Robert Sola, who won the Nobel Prize for this. So um, we're not going to get driven out of the world. There's always going to be FOSS for the rest of the, the, the foreseeable future, as far as I can tell. And I think that's good news. So um, why am I doing this? Well, I'm worried about Japan. Uh, I look around at the Japanese software industry. In the 1980s and 1990s, there was an alarmist movement among American observers, Edward Feigenbaum, um, uh, Ed Jordan, in, about fearing obsolescence because of the famously high quality of Japanese quality assurance. Also, the Japanese were deliberately trying to create the so-called knowledge engineering uh, revolution through their fifth generation project. Well, the first is true to some extent in embedded software and things like that, and the second um, basically failed. It managed to produce fuzzy things like Japanese input software because Japanese is an insanely complicated language to try and put into the computer, and you also have fuzzy washing machines and things like that, but no knowledge engineering revolution. Knowledge is much too fuzzy, apparently. Today, um, oh, I just said that. Um, I should also mention that I've talked to uh, Ruby founder um, Matsumoto about this stuff going on to the second part of the project. And he sees need for fundamental reform in the Japanese industry. So I came to Python, which I'm so, somewhat familiar with, because I think of it as a fairly successful open source, open community project, as opposed to something developed by a company or a small group of people who are very close knit. The Python community is huge. PyCon, um, Two years ago, had 2,500 people, and they were still turning, and they were still taking people in at the door. Um, that, that's in the U.S. I'm not sure what the one that's going to happen in a couple of months here is going to be like, but um, probably 300. 300, 350, something like that. Still, um, big communities everywhere, and the worldwide community is absolutely mine. It's unmanageable. We we can't really think of this as a company or a single organization. So, how do you deal with something like that? Or if you're small, but you just want to attract lots of people to come in, um, educators, for example, they would like to attract teachers and students from all over the world. And those people are not going to be intent on your project. They're going to want it for you know, the six weeks of their module on um, uh, some sort of hardware work or whatever it might be. So how do we manage a volunteer project, a community project like this? We need process. Everybody agrees with that. Um, software processes go back to uh, the um, bondage and discipline of, of the waterfall model. Fred Brooks from at IBM is Mythical Man Month, the Software Engineering Institute, and various DOD specifications for how you write a plan to write software. Um, in reaction to that idea of process, we have Eric Raymond, um, among others, with his uh, talk about the many eyes. He didn't invent the term, but he popularized it, I think, and his bizarre organization of software projects. But today, we think more in terms of some sort of, of semi-formal process, at least. Agile methodologies, process, yes, but no straight jackets, please. Right? That's what we're up to. And there are a legion of others that are uh, going on today. But everybody acknowledges that process is needed. So what does Python's process look like? Well, first of all, Python is open source, free software. Um, so. Again, we have this process light idea, less process, more product, right? That's what we want. That's what we think we're getting. Um, in these communities, we have massively distributed development. Every user is a contributor. You need to remember that when you're talking to those people who post insane questions on your mailing lists and things like that. These people are potential contributors. You can do something with them. They can help you. You can help them. Um, and you need to learn to manage them, uh, in my opinion. That's been my experience. We have open development, and that means two things. One is that every user is a literary critic of your code. They're going to complain about positions of apostrophes, whether you use English or American spelling, whether you um, use Chinese simplified or traditional characters, and so on and so forth. Um, this does tend to improve style in your code. People will tell you things, and if you listen, it helps. Um, the other aspect of open development, of course, is that reusability becomes really important. Um, there's a pull factor 
which is that people want it reused and they will say, look, if your software only did this or had this API, I could use it. And that pulls reusability out. There's also the push factor that um, you, you want to get your software out there and you want to organize your things so that you have a um, recombinable set of tools that you can put together easily. Of course, we don't want cargo cult programming where you just grab a few lines and so on. Um, we really want designed in modularity in the APIs and so on. We do want modules, but we do want reusability. Um, this is something that Mats has emphasized in the Japanese context. So um, there's a, a real application in social engineering um, that's coming up, although it's not directly relevant to Python. Um, so FOSS goes into the enterprise, right? Um, early FOSS was FOSS of the hacker by the hacker and for the hacker. Cowboy geniuses committed megalog patches and uh, the rest of us fixed the thousands of bugs introduced. I mean, you know, one bug per thousand lines, that's pretty high quality code by most standards, but if you put in a million, that's a lot of bugs. Um, still, uh, enterprises found FOSS to be an attractive method of development. They could use the modules because they were free. Um, of course, you have copyleft versus permissive licensing, but as long as your own business model can adapt to the particular license that's being used for the components you're using, um, you get it mostly for free. Uh, if you want support and things like that, you have to pay extra, of course. But that's much more um, that, that's much more acceptable in terms of the service model and the transparency of the economics of what you're doing to build your software. Um, so I have a bunch of examples there. And, but enterprises also need reliable platforms. They want reliable hardware, they want reliable operating systems, languages, libraries, and frameworks. Okay, and this is going to come back later um, in the demand for backward compatibility, which I'm going to emphasize. So here we are at Python, and finally get to Python in the Python trade. Um, seen spectacular growth in popularity, uh, probably not due to Eric Raymond pushing it, but he thinks so. Um, there's an obvious process in Python development. You may not be able to write it down, um, I haven't been able to write it down, but it's very clear that the Python development community, the core community that develops the language itself plus the standard library, has a very strong notion of process. I haven't really been able to talk to people like the Twisted Matrix people or PyPy or um, some of the other major add-ons, um, Django. Um, these are all people I'd like to talk to and see if this sort of spills over into their communities as well. But in Python, there's a very obvious process going on. Um, I interviewed a bunch of community members, development leaders, Python using project leaders, uh, Python using enterprises. And what I'm missing, as I say, is these framework developers. I really want to talk to them. That's something I really want to do in the future. Um, and one of the things, one of the symptoms that's important is they, they're the ones who complain most about Python 3. App developers generally don't have a problem with Python 3. Uh, they either migrate or they don't. But framework developers have customers on both sides of the fence. They have migrators and non-migrators and maybe later migrators, and the three different groups have very, very different requirements on the development process that they would like Python to adopt. Um, so really want to talk to the framework developers, and that's, that's an important thing that's missing so far. Uh, who have I talked to in particular? Um, Guido Van Rossum, of course, Nick Coughlin, Martin Van Lewis, um, who is important because of the Windows connection, uh, Barry Warsaw, who I know through GNU Mailman as well, um, and their organizers. Uh, Steve is, um, I, I can't remember any names that aren't Japanese anymore after 25 years there. It's, um, Steve is, uh, Steve Holden, not B. Steve Holden is a PSF uh, board member or was a board member, I think, and he organizes conferences like this one uh, for a living as well as doing teaching and consulting. Um, and Jesse, uh, again, I can't remember his name, was the guy who organized PyCon. Hmm? Jesse Lawrence. Yeah. Um, Jesse organized PyCon for two years or three years in a row, and that was a massive job. Um, hats off to him. 
Uh, application developer is basically limited to Barry at the moment. Um, he works on GNU Mailman and his day job um, for the period when I was talking to him was working on Launchpad. And I talked to uh, Andrew, um, I want to say Choi, but that's a different person, who is the, and Andrew Chen maybe, who is uh, CEO or CTO at Continuum Analytics. Um, so those are who I talked to. So what does a Pythonic process look like? How does Python organize things? We can talk about some of the elements. It's hard to talk about how it all fits together because it's all informal. But first, there's the BDFL. That's very obvious. You have the benevolent dictator for life, Guido Van Rossum, who makes the final decisions. However, delegation is very important in the Python process. Guido does not make all the decisions. So they have a practice they call a benevolent dictator for one pep, where a pep is a particular controversial thing that needs lots of discussion. Um, we have the Zen of Python, a group of sayings about how you should design your program and how you should write your program. Um, we have the peps themselves, and we have some module owners, as in um, other projects often, Somebody will own a particular module, but that's not very common in Python. Still, it does happen. A lot of conscious automation. I think everybody's aware of automation these days, so probably I don't need to say too much about that. But I would like to throw out some of the things that Python has done. And finally, there's the issue of channel discipline. How do people communicate with each other? And this is one of the things that at least the Python people think they're very weak on, despite having a lot of framework there. So that's something that I think would be interesting to hear a little bit about. Um, the Benevolent Dictator for Life, Guido Van Rossum, he's the founder. This kind of thing happens a lot. We have, of course, RMS, who is the BDFL for, or maybe, well, the BDFL for many different projects, Emacs, um, to some extent, most of the core GNU projects, GCC, uh, GLibc, and so on. He has a lot of influence over those. Uh, Larry Wall in Perl, uh, Matsumoto in Ruby, Theo Durat in OpenBSD, Linus Torvalds in Linux. Um, this seems to be somewhat related to Brooks' uh, theory that there should be one architect of a software system. It seems that it's very difficult for multiple people to actually architect a system. Um, this is one thing that I think Python's delegation system has managed to weaken. There are, Guido is not the only architect in Python. Um, they want to get tired, they do something else, whatever, um, and that's another place where delegation comes in. One of the things that they do a lot is they establish values. Uh, RMS is all about values. Um, Guido brings in a very strong emphasis on backward compatibility and now enterprise readiness. Uh, style, significant white space, what are you smoking was the reaction of most of the programming language community back in the 90s. Um, but it works. And so these kinds of things are something that the founder of the BDFL is um, responsible for installing and encouraging and sometimes enforcing. Uh, Guido himself started Python development in the late 1980s. The first external releases were in the early 1990s, if I remember correctly. I tried to check all this stuff, but um, unfortunately, wireless at SG doesn't like me very much. Um, he's the ultimate arbitrator of Pythonicity. What does that mean? It means that certain kinds of syntax are non-Pythonic. For example, Lambda is not Pythonic. Uh, Guido doesn't like anonymous functions, period. Um, he was willing to do that for one off little tiny expression like things, for example, extracting a key from a dictionary or something like that so that you can do sorting. But no more than that. Um, there's a legion of people who disagree with him, even in the Python community itself. But uh, that's something. He has his ideas about APIs. Um, he says if you are likely to be writing, um, uh, if you're likely to be writing a particular constant over and over again as an argument to a function, don't do that. Get that argument out of there and name the function. Give it two functions if there are two values for this argument. Um, so if you have a file with append, then you should um, write open append or something like that rather than open parentheses mode equal append. 
Um, in fact, with open, he doesn't do that. He follows C there, but um, that's one of the things that he talks about. Coding style, there's a whole pep about how you write things, how you name things, and so on. Do you use camel case? Do you use underscores? And so on. All of that. Um, these things are you know, something that the leader does. And whether you like the style or not, it makes Python programs more readable if everybody follows it. You know what you're looking at. And you don't get that cognitive dissonance when somebody has a very different style. Um, I don't want to see what Picasso would do to a Python program. Um, the other thing about Guido that I think is very important that we should learn from is that he's a skilled delegator. He attracts associates who know more than he does about lots of things. This is something, um, there was a book in the 70s called Up the Organization. And I'm not sure whether up meant the finger or um, your own rise in the organization, or maybe both. Uh, he wrote the, um, the book in Unix man style before Unix man actually existed. Um, each page basically is one topic. So if you ever get a chance to read the book, um, you know, it's, it's good for the reading room. Great, you put it there, you read it for five minutes, you put it down. Anyway, he said that good leaders can be recognized by the fact that the people around them are good. It's not that the good people make the leader look good, it's that the leader is there and he manages to, or she manages to assemble the people who are doing the good job. And then he lets them do their work. This is what delegation is all about. Guido is really good at this. Um, I wish I could tell you how to do it from watching Guido, but I don't know. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more, say no more. Um, one way you can delegate is you can let people own modules. This is sort of the traditional Linux lieutenant sort of kind of thing. You have people who own subsystems, they make the decisions, and Linux only very rarely overrules them. Um, when he does, it's pretty spectacular and fun to watch if you're inter interested in fireworks. Um, in, uh, in Python, the area of responsibility tends to be more self-contained than the subsystems that we often see uh, Linux lieutenants handling. Things like elementary, which is a specific module for XML processing, and it's fairly low level. It's not a full XML you know, with um, uh, XPath and all that kind of stuff. It's just the little pieces. Um, Tim sort is the workhorse sort function in Python, um, uh, and uh, that one's basically owned by Tim Peters, who also has a lot to do with the floating point stuff, the I, IEEE 754 standard. Um, most of these owned modules are specific libraries like elementary. Tim sort is a built, built in function that's a very exceptional. Almost nobody owns pieces of the core language and built in functions. Um, in Python, it's important when you contribute a whole module, it doesn't automatically make you the owner. You have to negotiate that. Um, typically, what Python wants, what Guido has established as the normal practice, is you contribute it, you promise to maintain it for a while, but anybody else who finds a bug can go in and fix it without your permission. Extensions can be added if the community agrees without your, permi your specific permission. And mostly, Guido treats Python as a whole in the same way. Um, the second aspect of de delegation is the benevolent dictator for one pep. Um, Guido often says, I don't have time to deal with this. Nick, you do it. Or Antoine, you do it. Or sometimes he says, I don't know who should do this. Is, is there somebody out there who knows about this problem? Um, usually not the person who's proposing the new feature or whatever it is, but somebody will come up. Um, in, in one case, uh, Brett Cannon raised his hand and said, oh, this happens to be my PhD thesis. And so Guido said, OK, you're the, you're the BDFL. You're the person who makes the decision on this path. And often the BDFL delegate, or BDF1P, is um, heavily involved in the development as well. Uh, sometimes this causes a little bit of personality conflict, but so far most people have trusted this, partly because they trust the people that Guido chooses, and partly because they trust Guido to step in in the, in the end if things get too hairy. Um, why is this um, useful? It broadens delegation to developers who aren't comfortable with the responsibility of owning something, so, and 
or maybe they don't want to own anything. And it also to aspects of the process, project which can't really be owned. We do PEPs on things like changing from um, subversion to mercurial. And it seems likely that we'll actually also move to Git in the more or less near future. Um, that's not clear yet. There are a lot of people who think we should dog food. There are a lot of people who just don't like Git and so on. But uh, from the point of view of recruiting new developers and having people know the tools when they get there, uh, Git has a lot to say for it. GitHub, GitLab, and so on. Uh, GitLab, I guess, is going away. Or, or is, no, it was another one. Gitosis, I guess, it is going away. GitLab is, is still going. So those things are attractive for the automation aspects. And Guido is not a fanatic about everything being open. Um, GitLab is open, so that probably where the community will push it if we go to Git. Um, anyway, uh, it broadens the aspect of leadership in the project. We have lots of people who are leaders in the project. And they are not jerks about it. There's a, a protocol for how you do these things. Um, okay, moving on. The Zen of Python. Um, it's a group of sayings by Tim Peters. Uh, you can find out what they are exactly by typing Python-m this, which is a, a Zen reference. And there are things like there's only one obvious way to do it. Or actually, it's, there's, there's one obvious and normally only one obvious way to do things. Um, which is in contrast to Perl, there's always more than one way to do it. Um, so which one do you like? That's up to you. Uh, I happen to like the Zen. I happen to like these principles. Not every three line function needs to be built in and uh, a bunch of others. Uh, better now than never, but sometimes better never than right now and things like that. I like these principles, but that doesn't matter really. That's not what makes this work. In, that is. It matters to me personally, but why does Python work so well? Python works so well in part because when you pick up a Python program, you know the style already. You don't have to move from Rubens to Picasso or from, from Bach to the Beatles. Well, actually, that's not such a long jump. Uh, from Bach to Philip Glass. Um, it makes it composable. People tend to express themselves in the same way. There's a certain pattern to the APIs and so on. And this makes it much easier to put things, put parts together um, when you're building a program out of existing pieces, out of existing software. The PEPs, formal proposals for changes to the language or module additions to the standard library. Most changes to the language are pepped. Most evolutionary changes to the std lab are not. Things that um, you know, for example, adding a few new uh, functions to an old module that handles some corner cases or something like that usually are not particularly controversial and they'll sort of <coughs> wave through um, and without a formal pep after some discussion. On the other hand, uh, adding a new one, for example, um, one of the big ones recently was Python finally added an enum class. So you can now have named constants, and they will appear in printout from the, uh, the print function and so on as named constants rather than the integers that are sitting behind them, things like that. Anybody can write one. Uh, the cri acceptance criteria are basically IETF-like, rough consensus and running code. You have to have an implementation or it won't be accepted. Um, there are lots of PEPs get um, turned down. I forgot to write that, but lots of them get turned down. In fact, some PEPs are written specifically to be turned down. Guido says, this is the third time I've seen this stupid idea. Let's explain why it's stupid, write it down, write a PEP, and finally reject it. Um, so it's a compact record of controversies, the arguments, pro and con, and the outcome. This is very useful both for people who are trying to understand what Pythonicity means and also for people who have a specific interest in improving Python and are wondering whether their particular proposal is going to go through or not. Um, if there's something like it that has been refused, if there's something like it that's been sitting and not being improved for a while, 
that gives you a lot of clue to where things could go in the future. Um, and as I, as I said, there's no presumption of acceptance, and in fact, a lot get refused. Some even get refused intentionally, uh, written to be refused. This helps to act as a break on some of the more radical ideas. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Radical is good sometimes. Um, Python 3 is radical, obviously, um, in, at least in the sense of changing things at the root. And that was a big experiment. At the time, Guido made a few remarks that I interpret him thinking of this as an experiment. Backward compatibility is really important, but we're sick of the restrictions that we're facing, and so we're just going to make a complete break. Um, we're going to keep the good things in Python, but we're not going to worry about breaking people who depend on the bad things. And that was what Python 3 was about. That's pretty much what happened. There were some big mistakes made. Um, for example, when he split bytes and Unicode apart and made, byte, uh, made string the, the, the fundamental string type be Unicode, he took away things like regular expression processing and so on from the bytes. That turns out to be a big mistake because these are basically character streams and they're treated that way, especially in web development. So we should have had that. We should have had things like um, starts with and ends with and so on and eventually those things have been brought back in. And most recently there was a PEP which was accepted to add um, percent formatting back in for bytes. So um, not everything goes perfectly well, but there's this um, idea that there should be a break on radical decisions and make big breaks all at once. And that's what happened with Python 3. Um, a lot of conscious in automation in the, in the project, in particular when they've migrated on VCSs, they went from CVS to um, Subversion, that had a PEP. Uh, when they went from Subversion to Mercurial, that had a PEP, and now they might go to Git again. In fact, the um, Mercurial migration had two. Um, there were three candidates, Bazaar, uh, Git, and Mercurial, and um, so we had a, a face-off in one PEP on the three different um, VCSs. And then when Mercurial was chosen, they had to have a plan, and they decided to write that up as a PEP. So very formal process in that sense. Um, have lots of mailing lists, issue trackers. Uh, most of the bugs and simple package, patches are handled there. People who are interested discuss them on the issue tracker, and they never appear on the mailing lists. Um, there's an automated re review tool called uh, Readfeld, which I um, believe it's an app engine app that uh, Guido either wrote or um, upgraded. Automated testing using BuildBot, and there's a lot of proposals for further automa automation of continuous integration and things like that. Um, channel discipline. How do people talk to each other? This is really important. How are we doing for time? Um, I'm, all, I'm over time, actually. Courtesy is demanded. Censorship is very rare. There are six levels of lists there. There's the Python list itself, which also is gateway to Complang Python for users. That includes downstream libraries and framework developers. Twisted Matrix, SciPy, NumPy, those people are mostly supposed to be talking about their problems in writing Python on the general users list. There's core mentorship, which is um, what it sounds like. New core developers are given advice there. Here's a good bug you could start with, things like that. Python ideas is for developers with undeveloped ideas, bare proposals, and things like that that don't have a lot of backing, but hey, this is blue sky idea, what do you think? And Python dev is for fine tuning the concrete pro proposals, discussion of PEPs, and things like that. Other stuff leaks in, but often gets um, pushed back. Um, then there's the issue tracker itself and Reekfeld, which have their very specialized purposes. And finally, there are a bunch of SIGs um, mailing lists for disk utils um, and packaging uh, for email. And then there's a Python tutor list, which is an adjunct to the Python list that has the same kind of function as uh, core mentorship, except that it's for general developers of in Python. The appropriate level is enforced gently but firmly. Um, why do application developers and so on like Python? Uh, language preference is there, but it's a welcoming community. Of course, it's a big community, lots of busy people, and you don't always get 
a hug when you come in. Um, but people don't slap you in the face either. And if you're willing to be quiet and explain what your needs are, somebody will eventually talk to you. And um, people who are experienced programmers of Python who have a need for a new feature in Python um, usually get a good welcome. Then um, backward compatibility is a very big feature for most people who are developing in Python. It's a platform for them. And they can develop their own features that they need. They don't really need to see the latest in, in language design features in there. They do want to be able to um, upgrade and not have their entire system um, subject to breakage because they want to use oh, generators or something like that um, in one module and all the others then have to be tweaked for all the little tiny things. So backward compatibility is really important. Um, batteries included and you can get extra power packs from the Python package index. Um, this is very easy, just pip and the name of the module and it's installed for the right, right uh, version of Python if that's your default. Otherwise you add a version number and you get the right one. Um, the community puts a lot of effort into maintaining this. Not everybody, but there are people who really care about the package index and they take a lot of time and effort on that. Um, okay, finally, what's the bottom line? Delegation frees up leader time and strengthens the associate's leadership skills. It makes a stronger community. Collaboration in a diverse, dispersed community is just plain hard. Um, there's substantial dissatisfaction in Python with the communication channels we have, but there's no consensus on how to improve the situation. So um, if you're a small community, if you're a new project, your, mile, your, your mileage is going to vary on the specifics. I don't know what you need, and I can't really say Python is a good model for you. Maybe there are some things here you should look at. The current focus in Python is improving existing tools, moving to Mailman 3 when we finally release it, um, better review tools, Readfield was good but not good enough, um, more continuous integration, <coughs> things like that. Um, for platform tools like a language or a major framework or something like that, backward compatibility from early on is really important to acceptance in the enterprise. Um, Guido and others still recall the Boolean mini fiasco with paint. Uh, they introduced the Boolean type in a point one release and it broke the world for some people because their tests depended on zero and one coming out and it was coming out as true and false and so they were getting exceptions and the whole thing broke. Um, finally, process automation especially tests helps a lot. Done. And um, since I have no time, uh, you'll have to ask me out of band about Python 3, and that's the end. No more slides. Well, I have more slides, but no time. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. software, the proportion stays the same. So FOSS is not going to go exponentially or asymptotically to zero as a fraction of the software that's out there. There's always going to be a significant fraction of FOSS out there for you. As for Python, um, Python isn't going to grow that way. Python's going to have an S-curve just like every other single project or whatever. But my point is, is, is looking at the an open source program, programming language actually can you infer that much about open source projects in general? No, this is a very, very abstract model. It's a very simple macro, uh, a very macro kind of model. I have quantity of software, and software is used to produce software and labor, and that's all. So it doesn't really have anything to do with that. I didn't mean about the model. In the case that any focus is 
start oh, with okay. that, then you, then you focus on Python. Yeah, as far as, as, far as the, uh, the stuff I talked about Python, um, some of it's generalizable and some of it's not. Um, but I wanted to throw out in an organized fashion what I've learned about how Python works, what I think makes it succeed, and suggest that people <coughs> look at that and study that for their own projects. Um, and there are a few you know, clear lessons. The delegation lesson, I think, is very generic um, because you can see it in various places. Uh, you can see it in, uh, in, in Linux. You can see it not working in Emacs. Um, RMS just won't let go. And he, he shows up every once in a while and says, you can't do that. Um, and he has his reasons, which are valid on his grounds, but it doesn't help the project to grow. And so delegation is really important. That's about the only thing that I would say everybody should learn, is that you need to let go of your project enough to let smart people help you build it. Other than that, I think we should let the next thing go. Definitely. We started with workshops, so we But I guess people who are interested can also come and corner you. Yeah, sure. I'll be here tomorrow. OK, thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> you.